There were two kinds of people who had enough time and money to train jiu-jitsu in the middle of the day. Number one was cops and firefighters, and number two were criminals. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 478, with today's guest, Mr. Stefan Kesting. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick, and everything we do at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, check out whistlekick.com. That's the place to learn all about our projects and our products. It's also the easiest way to find our store. Make sure you use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on everything we've got going on over there. Now, the show has a whole separate website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two brand new episodes every week, and the goal of the show and of Whistlekick overall is to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, you can do a number of things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, maybe tell a friend, pick up a book at Amazon, leave a review, or support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content, and if you're contributing as little as $5 a month, you're going to get access to even more stuff. If you spend any time in the martial arts sections of YouTube, you likely have stumbled on today's guest. He's been doing good work for quite a bit of time now, and he's developed quite the following. So I was pretty honored to get the opportunity to talk to him. We had a good conversation, and admittedly, it went in directions I wasn't even planning. Which, I don't know about you, that's my favorite part of the show. So without further ado, Stefan, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, <laughs> even though it's uh, before 6 a.m. on the West Coast. It's, it's, so, it's so early, and I thank you for your willingness to conduct your schedule in that way well you did you get up i'm sure everyone listening has got up early to go train at a seminar or gets up early to go to work or yeah. you know why why are martial artists exempt from uh, <laughs> we're we're certainly not uh there have been a number of days i've i've woken up and and been driving to a tournament and realized it's it's 4 a.m it's not tomorrow yet <laughs> <laughs> didn't i just go to bed <laughs> yeah yeah, the, the things that we do for the things that we love. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in theory, we make this sleep up later. In reality, we never do. Uh, I mean, I'm, in addition to the whole martial arts aspect of my life, I'm also a firefighter. So there I get zero choice about when to get up and when to go to sleep. Because when the emergency comes in, you get out of bed or you get up from the chair and you go. It doesn't matter if you're tired. So yeah. The, uh, yeah. Now, now, what kind of fire company are, are, are you part of here in the northeast most fire departments are volunteers so i'm used to people having pagers and, and such no no i'm i'm full-time I've, I've been doing with a, a city fire department for 21 years and i'm still enjoying it and that's the most important thing uh 22 23 years ago i was on a super long drive i, I was doing martial arts i've been doing, doing martial arts for oh good lord something like 35 years but I didn't want to make it my full-time gig and run a school. That's, that's what I didn't want to do. And so I was working other jobs, and we had this one, I was working as a biologist, actually. I was on a 12-hour drive up north to go do an inventory of an area. And I was like, man, I don't want to do this. What do I want to do with my life? And it was actually martial arts that was a big component of figuring out what I wanted to do, because... Martial arts is real-time problem solving, right? You, you have a bunch of knowledge and you have a bunch of skills and you and I can go train and it doesn't matter if we're working, I don't know, spinning hook kick defenses or uh, wrist grab defenses or arm bars on the ground or a weird inversion from a scissor guard type of position into a outside heel hook or whatever. We can go practice that and then we can go apply it. Hopefully, we're applying it. Hopefully, we're doing it against resistance, in some form of sparring, under pressure, and we can see how that works or doesn't work, where the shortcomings are, where it succeeds, where it fails. And I really like that about martial arts. And so I was trying to find sort of the job equivalent of that. 
And after much, much, much thinking, I decided that for firefight, that for me, that was firefighting because you can go and you can train throwing ladders against the building. You can train pulling hoses. You can train cutting up cars. You can train your medical stuff. You can train your hazmat stuff. And there are ways to train this and there are scenarios that you do, but it's still not the real thing. And then along comes the real thing and you can see how you did and you can watch training turn into application. You can watch all this theoretical stuff actually get used in real life. And I, I, that was sort of the, one of the core ideas as to why I became a firefighter. Or, or maybe you could just simplify the whole thing and say I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that would be a more parsimonious <laughs> explanation, a simpler explanation. And that's, you know, Occam's razor might say that that's correct. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm a full-time firefighter and I still really enjoy it. And I hope that if I stopped enjoying it, I would leave. Mm. What I'm wondering is how was firefighter even in the conversation? It's not a, a job that, I mean, I don't know what the, the numbers are, but it's not a job that I, I even hear people talk about. I remember when I was a kid, you know, the, the, the cliche job, oh, I want to be a policeman, I want to be a firefighter. You know, it happens at that younger age, but. I was never that kid. It really? Okay. Complete- that would have been as foreign to me. I, I wanted to be an astronaut more than I wanted to be a firefighter, right? I, I thought that this was a, a, being an astronaut would be a viable job option more than being a firefighter. It was never on my radar at all. I will say it was jiu-jitsu that brought me to firefighting because at the time I was working as a contractor. I'd, I'd be working, but I had some flexibility over my schedule. So I'd be training jiu-jitsu during the days. And really there were, uh, to, to, to paint with a very broad brush, there were two kinds of people who had enough time and money to train jiu-jitsu in the middle of the days. Number one was cops and firefighters, and number two were criminals. So I trained at a club <laughs> where there were a fair number of cops and firefighters, and then at the same club, in the same class, there'd be some people with pretty dodgy money-making methods. And, uh, and so that was... That got me thinking, like, what are these people doing that allows them to train in the middle of the day? Why can they, you know, why aren't they chained to a desk? Why aren't they chained to a cubicle? And the answer was, well, some of them probably sold drugs. I, in, in most cases, I could make a pretty strong argument that they were doing some pretty bad stuff. And the other guys were cops and firefighters. I didn't want to be a cop. So, yeah, if you... Process of elimination. Yeah, process of elimination. Yeah. But it wasn't that. That was it. Just opened the possibility to me. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are so many possibilities in the world that uh, you've not considered. So exposing yourself to to as many of them as you can opened your mind. I mean, it's the same way I started training uh, in Kajukembo, which was one of my main martial arts. I had moved to a new city, and I was looking for a club to train at. I knew I didn't want to do Kung Fu that I'd been doing, I was frankly sick and tired of kind of the stilted, performative martial arts where you're doing the same form over and over and over and over, the same kata over and over and over, and pretending that you're punching somebody in the face and leaping over here and kicking his buddy, his imaginary buddy in the knee, and then jumping over here and doing a front roll and telling yourself that this was all what you were doing. I was tired of that. And I was looking for something new, but I didn't know what I wanted. So I did, the, I did the right thing. I, I was pretty smart when I was 18 for once, or rather I did a smart thing when I was 18. I went and visited just about every martial arts club in the city that I was even peripherally interested in. And took a class, sat in a class, watched a class, asked all the questions, made notes. And then the next night I went to a new class and tried another one. When you think of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours that you're potentially going to train, if you you stick with it, and in my case, tens of thousands of hours now, or maybe a hundred thousand hours, I don't know anymore. It's totally worth putting in the front end work to go try a whole bunch of different schools. If somebody's thinking about starting, or if somebody's thinking about quitting and starting a new martial art, totally worth your time to go train at as many different places as you can to experience as much of the peripheral stuff 
as you can. Right? Maybe you didn't know that you're interested in Filipino stick fighting. Maybe you didn't know that you're interested in Bondo. Maybe you didn't know that you were interested in this jiu-jitsu stuff. Maybe you didn't know that you really wanted to do Thai boxing. Maybe you didn't know. And it's really only by experiencing it that you, uh, that you can get that gut knowledge about, like, man, this feels good. This feels like a good fit. And I like the people who train here, and I like that instructor. And you know, the, there are no bell testing fees or, or whatever it is that you need to train. And so by making that comparative journey, it's, you may find the right place to train at. And you're also increasing your knowledge about the martial arts. Like, man, I never want to train that Filipino stick fighting. I, it just doesn't appeal to me. But now I know what I'm talking about when I, well, I, I know a little bit of what I'm talking about because I went and tried a class. Uh, man, I'm, I hate that jujitsu stuff, but here's why I hate it, as opposed to this just vague sense of dread of like, why would I put on pajamas and roll around on the ground with other men? Now you know that, man, that really hurts my shoulder. Now you've got a real reason, because you went and experienced it. So it's experiential learning that uh, is, is super valuable, and it'll lead you down some rabbit holes that you never knew existed. You have, you have to explore some rabbit holes that you weren't even aware of. The way you just talked about that tells me that there's there's another side of that that coin that how did you put it you know saying that you dislike something without the experience it sounds like that's a conversation that's come up maybe something that that irks you am i poking at something that's not there i i think it's a it's a general point that okay. many many people have opinions about something that they know nothing about i think i, I come from a science background and in science you're reasonably comfortable with not knowing the answer to something. I was I forget who it was who said this, but scientists get bored with the stuff that they already know, and they're looking with glee at the stuff that they don't, because that's where the growth is, right? Uh, so they're comfortable in not knowing, or rather they're spurred on by not knowing. Whereas the person who knows everything you got to be careful, that person, in, in any endeavor, in any field. Either you've lucked out and you've, you know, I don't know, let's pick another example. Let's pick whitewater paddling. Pick whitewater paddling and you run into somebody who seems incredibly knowledgeable. That's great. Maybe you have run into the savant of whitewater paddling who knows every paddle, knows every boat, knows every river, knows every creek, knows every paddler. But at a certain point, you want people to, I, I respect people more when they admit the limits of their knowledge, when they say stuff like, I don't know, let's find out. Uh, it was a shock to me coming from the traditional martial arts in the, as a teenager, when I started training in uh, JKD with Makoto Kabayama, otherwise known as Nip. Uh, and yes, he is uh, Japanese, and yes, that was a name that he went by at the time. Um, when I started training with him, my first or second class, he was like, look, you can ask me any question you want. I may or may not know the answer. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, and we'll try and figure it out together. So here's a martial artist instructor, a martial arts teacher, admitting right off the bat that he doesn't know everything. And that, uh, that, that it's possible for him not to know something about martial arts. And this gave me, as opposed to decreasing my respect for him, this usually increased my respect for him. Because, of course, nobody knows everything about everything in physics. Or, or you might have a person who's just a wicked, wicked, wicked Chinese food cook. They can cook every type of Chinese food. They can cook Szechuan. They can cook Hong Kong-style food. They can whatever. They, they, they can cook Cantonese food. But you ask them a question about French cuisine, how do you make the reduction of duck tongue pate or, or whatever it is? I, I, yeah. I don't know much about French. Let's, let's assume there's a thing called duck tongue pate. Hopefully the person says, I don't know. Because if they do tell you, well, here's how to do it, they're, they're probably making it up. So I think in general, I really appreciate people who admit the limits of their knowledge. And it's okay not not know something. And, and sometimes the worst information that you get is, bad information as opposed to people saying, I don't know. Just that bit that you talked about as well as 
I believe being the first person in close to 500 episodes to use the term of Occam's razor on the show, which, which is something that, you know, I, I come from a bit of a science background myself. And so I can really appreciate that mindset and bringing it into the martial arts, I think gives that open mind uh, a bit of an advantage. And, you know, I, I, I know a bit about your background, you know, I've, I've heard you on other shows and, and, and I've certainly checked out your work, but it does seem like you bring this scientific perspective, if not method, into what you do. Am I right? I think so. I think the most, I was, I was wondering about this the other day and, you know, I, I've got a master's of science. Okay. So a master's of science in botany and a bachelor's of science in biology. So biology is sort of all life, broad overview of all physical, uh, biological processes. And then botany gets a bit more specific. And I'm going to lose half of your audience here. I apologize. I did a master's in climate change related uh, Arctic biology. So I've mentioned there, I've done it. I mentioned climate change. And you can hear the people clicking off. <laughs> uh, I apologize. But I, really. I suspect we're all here to talk about martial arts and yeah. listen about martial arts. So the fact that this is one of your credentials, I don't think takes anything away. And if it yeah. does take something away, then, then uh, tough. But the point of, that I was trying to make um, before I distracted myself <laughs> is what's the real value of a scientific education? I mean, yes, I vaguely remember stuff about the Krebs cycle at a cellular, you know, cellular energy processing and yeah i can name parts of a cell and yeah i can come up with interesting factoids about how the the, the eye evolved and you know things about the fossil record and things about arctic plant communities and you know that's all well and good and uh, when i'm on a new trip in the arctic some of that stuff comes back to me and i'm like oh yes look at that chrome hulks over there but aside from sort of Trivia is the wrong word. But aside from the knowledge, what are the underlying principles of a scientific education that, that are useful everywhere? And I think it's, it, I haven't made a complete list, but it's things like admitting the limits of your knowledge in a particular field at a particular time. And that's, that's super valuable. I also think it's um, ideas of around statistics, and that sounds pretty boring, but I'll give a real life example. Uh, I got this one from my friend Rob Bernanke. Are you, uh, presumably, some of your audience, most of your audience has the idea, they know what an arm bar is. I would imagine. Okay. And you know that you can do an arm bar from the guard. And the way that the arm bar from the guard is often taught initially, you're basically there in the guard at the bottom, and you pivot 90 degrees and you throw your legs up and you catch an arm bar and you tap the guy out. Yay. All right. So this is one of those techniques that basic way of doing that armbar from the guard is one of those techniques that works really great against white belts. White belts do it to each other all the time. It happens in MMA sometimes just because of the chaos of the movement. Uh, somebody gets super excited about punching somebody else in the head and they spin into an armbar. Um, I've seen it done in self-defense. Uh, a friend of mine did it off the hood of a car when some guy rushed him at a party. It works. but it can be argued it's a false signal, right? So it's not really relevant to jujitsu at a higher level because it's really easy to stop. So it's something that you go into the sport or the art, you're doing it and you're doing it all the time, but then it stops working. It's not really that you need to spend more time doing that particular move. You need to find a different way to achieve the same goal, which is starting the guard and ending up in the armbar. And there are definitely high percentage ways to do that that work against good people. But that's kind of a, an idea of a false positive, right? That's kind of a statistical concept that I got from my scientific education that, that you can get signals which would seem to indicate uh, that, that you have something, but you don't. It's a false positive, and it, it's an easy trap to fall into. You know, people run into this in, in, I don't know, when's the last time I heard of false positives? In uh, medical and medical stuff, when people say they've got, I've got a bad back, the MRI shows that I've got a herniated disc. 
everyone's talked to somebody or everyone's had a herniated disc, or everyone's talked to somebody and they've, that they've got the MRI showed that they have a herniated disc. Well, an MRI is a great tool, but it has false positives and it has false negatives. A false positive is saying it looks like is that your, the MRI shows that there's a herniation when the disc is bulging, but it isn't actually, or it isn't as bad a problem as it shows. And a false negative is, no, it really is bulging, but it doesn't show up on the MRI. And in my long and painful journey as a martial artist, for 35 years with lots of injuries, I've had x-rays come back that have been false negatives. I broke my foot pretty good, and the initial x-ray didn't show anything, false negative. And I've had... Uh, things come back as false positives, and there's the, uh, the herniated disc is a good example. So I, I think some of the ideas that, uh, that I came up with in the scientific education process, so seven or eight years of university and then working in the field, are, are totally applicable to life. I think a basic understanding of statistics is one. Just because you know one person who smoked till they were 105 doesn't mean that overall smoking is good for you. <laughs> That's not a... A one is not a sample size. Just because you know one person who can make the jump, spinning, double tornado kick work one time in an MMA fight doesn't mean that you should spend most of your time working the jump, spinning, double tornado kick. Let's take a look at statistically what the higher percentage techniques are in a fight, in a match, in an MMA fight, in a tournament. And you probably find that the bread and butter stuff works most of the time. At, and again, we want to look at a higher level because you want to set yourself up for uh, stuff that's going to keep on working and uh, be effective against better people. And so you can look at that sort of statistically and say, what are the top guys doing that's working consistently? And that's probably a much better signal than one time my buddy landed this crazy move and totally flattened the guy one time. And he says he did. And we don't really have video proof, right? Fix or it didn't happen. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the, uh, that'd be an example of a of bad data driving your decision. There are seems to be a lot of this uh, scientific approach coming into the grappling BJJ community these days. I know other people who are using these terms, high percentage, and and even conducting, you know, sort of not quite back of the napkin, but some involved study, watching videos, watching matches, and understanding sequences and how the data shows people can or maybe should respond in certain circumstances. Was that something you started bringing into your early days of No, not training? really. Early no. days, I was a technique collector, just like most people are. Okay. Dude, there's like this other way to do this, escape from the side, or, or you could escape from this way, or you could escape from this way, or you could escape this way, or you could escape this way. When did that start to shift stuff. then? Yeah. I think because you're taking this mindset further than yeah. than anyone else I've had the, had a conversation with. It's a, it's a gradual process. It was a gradual process for me. Uh, I don't know if you've had him on the podcast, but Eric Paulson is a good friend of mine, and I'm an instructor under him, and he's a, taught me a ton about grappling. And he comes from the one of his influences is the whole KKD. Um, Mixed martial arts in the original sense of mixed martial arts, and that we'll train Indonesian Salat, we'll train Filipino martial arts, we'll train Sambo, we'll train this, we'll train that, we'll, we'll get as much knowledge as we can from as many different fields as we can. And that's fantastic. And I've learned a lot doing that broad, broad, broad approach. But I remember doing a seminar with Eric Paulson, I want to say 1993. It could be off by a year or two. And he was showing this leg lock and that leg lock and this leg lock and that leg lock. And then he stopped and said, but the one that works most often is this one. And that was the first time somebody had said that to me. Because they're more than happy to show you dragon fist, monkey fist, phoenix eye fist, you know, ox hand, this, that, the other thing. They're happy to show you a hundred different techniques. They're happy to show you how much they know without providing a context without saying, but when push comes to shove, this is the one that works. And where I think that emphasis on the stuff that works comes from is anytime you can test it. Uh, a friend of mine, 
and a guy I've had on my podcast, Chris Duffin, one of the world's strongest, strongest, strongest men. Right? He's deadlifted. He's done things like deadlift 800 pounds every day for a month. Uh, or no, he squatted 800 pounds every day for a month. Man. He has deadlifted 1,000 pounds for multiple reps. He's now he's working on squatting 1,000 pounds for multiple reps. 43. He's not, I mean, he's big. He's not like 400 pounds. He's not like the mountain in Game of Thrones. So, in his squatting, it's pretty empirical. Either you lifted it or you didn't. Either that weight went down and came up and you passed the benchmarks for what, what constitutes an acceptable squat or you got crushed under the weight. Now, imagine if we had weightlifting but it was all theoretical. And we would practice weightlifting uh, without weight. And we would develop a thousand different ways of lifting that imaginary barbell. And then we got rewarded by the more creative we got lifting that barbell. I'm going to lift that barbell with the bottom of my feet while doing a handstand. Because there's no barbell there. There's no way to test. I'm going to do um, a side plank and hold the barbell with three fingers while balancing on my other two fingers on the ground while moving my head in a circle. I'm, I'm just coming up with this on the fly if you can't yeah. tell. Yeah. Uh, and without weight there, without that weight to keep you honest, you could develop a thousand different ways of doing something, be very, very creative, and it would end up looking like interpretive dance. And then you put a real barbell on there and you would crush, you get crushed. Right, one after another, you could take the top 100 creative interpretive dance weightlifters, put 500 pounds on them, and they would just get driven into the ground. And this is essentially what happened in the early UFC. Right, you had really well meaning, really hard training people coming out who would practice their tempo, who would practice their monkey style kung fu, who would practice their wing chun, who would practice their whatever tai chi but they had never pressure tested it against real pressure. They pressure tested it, may, if, if at all, within the confines of their own martial art. They were push hands guys, they, or sorry, if they were Tai Chi guys, they would have done push hands with other Tai Chi guys. If they were Wing Chun guys, they would have done sticking hands with other, uh, with other sticking, with other Wing Chun guys, right? They would have stayed within the constraints of their martial art. And now all of a sudden, they're under that 500 pound dumbbell and I'm not making fun of them because that's how they've been taught, but they got crushed. So it's that ability to test the ability to have, to try and do something to somebody who's resisting pretty much full force or has the option of pretty much, if you and I are doing jujitsu and, and we're doing a fairly hard sparring session, not that every sparring session is just to be full force, you really don't want me to choke you, and I really don't want to choke you, or I, I really don't want you to choke me, but I really do want to choke you, and it'd be great if you could choke me, right? So we're, we're strongly incentivized to provide resistance, to provide real world, real world feedback. So in that case, if I think of something, this amazing inverting, rolling through the leg uh, back take that I'm going to try and do on you, but it not a good idea. It, it, it doesn't work in this current incarnation. I'm going to get crushed. Right? I'm going to be that theoretical interpretive dance weightlifter who just all of a sudden had a 500 pound dar uh, barbell put on his shoulders and is now trying to uh, do something, do some crazy lift. There's only really one way to lift that barbell. I mean, there's subtle variations, right? You can, your knees could be two inches further out to the side. Your body could be 10 degrees more vertical or 10 degrees more bent over. But nobody's doing a thousand pound what with one leg nobody so uh, the ability of the martial arts to provide real world feedback as to especially if it's being tested is what i really love about it and once that starts happening you're starting to do statistics on your own right you're starting to apply uh you're keeping track initially it might be hey this side mount escape worked on bobby twice uh, didn't work on Gord and worked on Freddy every single time I do it. That's 
kind of beginning to build a statistical distribution of what it of what works and what doesn't. Now, when you start seeing, say, a world champion do that escape on another world champion, that's a great big whopping data point. Like, okay, not only am I managing to pull it off at my level here at the, the recreational club, but I'm doing the same thing that Leandro Lowe is doing. I'm doing the same thing that Marcelo Garcia did 10 years ago. I'm doing the same thing that Keenan Cornelius just did at European. So even if people aren't formally looking at it statistically, they're kind of doing it informally. They're kind of tracking what's working, what's not. Because every, nobody wants to be crushed by that 500-pound barbell suddenly appearing over their, over their body and again, their, their theoretical knowledge hitting the, uh, the bricks of cold, cruel reality. <laughs> it's a pretty good mindset. And I think it's one, I, I, I like the way you kind of tied it up a bit at the end there, this idea that we all do this instinctively. Because I could imagine some people listening and thinking, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't have any data. I don't know, you know, should, you know, because we have people who are, who are grapplers and non-grapplers listening to this mm -hmm. show, you know, do, should I have well, my left foot thing, forward? The same or? thing would work in a striking context. Exactly. Same thing exactly. would work in, uh, I mean, Filipino martial arts, there are, it's dangerous sometimes. I, that's the unfortunate part. It's Say we were just doing stick fighting and you were just doing drills by yourself and you're jumping around waving that stick in the air. The odds of you catastrophically injuring yourself are fairly low. Right? I mean, it's true you could hit yourself in the head with a stick. That's true. Um, I, I have slammed myself in the groin by you know, doing the wild kung fu staff spinning as a, as a kid. That was not a good day. But overall, the odds of uh, catastrophically injuring yourself are pretty low. But now you go test it Dog Brothers style. Uh, for those that don't know, it's a group of, I'll call them Filipino martial art minimalists. So they're doing full contact stick fighting while wearing fencing helmets and maybe like little batting gloves. Or the, back when I used to do it, they wore a little bit more. So it'd be hockey gloves, maybe elbow pads and uh, fencing masks, some guys wore knee pads, and you were really trying to club the other guy with your rattan stick. Now, some of them have taken it further and done it with like hardwood sticks, but that provided, you know, you'd, you'd spar three rounds, four rounds, two minutes, but in those eight minutes, you'd get so much information to calibrate the rest of your training. So yeah, all this is well and good, all this fancy spinning stuff is well and good. But when push really comes to shove, what do people revert to? They revert to uh, a clubbing attack coming from the upper right-hand quadrant. They revert to some kind of backhand, and they revert to some wild stabbing motion. That, that's, I mean, there's more to it than that. But those are the three of the things you see most often. That's the jab, the cross, and the hook of boxing. And then there's subtlety in deploying those uh, fewer movements, but it really strips everything away. There's actually, I don't know if you saw this, there's this insane videos of, you know, historical European martial arts, right? Where guys yeah. put on uh, armor and they clash at each other with swords and they have rules that, you know, and points. Um, well, there's this insane group of Germans, of course they're Germans, who've started doing this with sharp swords. I don't know how often they do it, but they've got essentially wearing gauntlets and helmets with a ton of neck protection and sharp swords. <laughs> and, uh, huh. or, except they've also, you know, they include like sword, sword and shield, two-handed sword and axe and shield. And yes, they get some pretty bad cuts. I don't know what kind of... Um, it sure looks like they're going all out. I mean, they, the difference is when one guy falls on the ground, the other guy doesn't spear him in the throat. And it may only be slashes. I don't think they're doing stabs. But that would, it's like um, knowing that you're going to be shot in the morning focuses the mind wonderfully. Knowing that there's a, a stick whistling towards your head or an arm bar coming your way, or in the case of the crazy Germans, a very sharp axe swinging for your thigh 
would also sharpen your mind wonderfully. And very quickly, you would leave out some of the more esoteric aspects of your martial art. Right? It, it would simplify your technique choice considerably. I'm just trying to imagine the mindset of someone who steps in to do that. I, I understand pressure testing. I understand grappling and going hard. And, you know, I've certainly taken my lumps over the years, but I can't envision stepping in holding a shield while I know someone with a sharp ax is going to swing it at me. I think that takes us to status, probably. I, I think there are there are people who who lack, you know, who have a much higher threshold that they need to meet in order to get excited. We've all met them. Like they're they're adrenaline junkies. Some people get excited and are at a ten out of ten adrenaline, making a left hand turn across traffic. Right, they're driving and oh my god, I have to turn left and there's a car coming and there's a car behind me and ah, right. So they're at a ten out of ten excitement level, turning left into traffic. And other people have to hurl themselves off of a cliff in a wingsuit and fly down 10 feet from the rock to, to get to the same level of excitement. So clearly some people need higher levels of stimulation, higher levels of danger to feel the equivalent amount alive. Uh, I'm not at the full 10 out of 10 level, I, although I would, love to fly, I would love to fly a wingsuit one day, but I don't want to fly close to a cliff. Right? So I'm not full-on crazy, I think. But I'm probably towards the slightly crazier end of things. Especially take a look at some of the things I've done for rec my recreation, for my job, really. Uh, you know, we get excited when there's a fire. You know, Yay, there's a fire! I mean, it's, it's kind of a crappy attitude because somebody's entire life is burning up, but the actual activity is fun, and I suppose it's better that we're looking forward to it with excitement rather than fear and uh, and loathing. I've just gone down my own rabbit hole here. I, uh, I don't. I don't think it would work <laughs> without that. You know, yeah. I, I, th I think there's something to be said. You know, yeah, yeah you, certainly you're you're cognizant of the fact that someone's life is being dramatically, maybe even irreparably changed. But if well, you we're going to do everything we can to fix it, and if yeah. we're going to do that, then we might as well be trying to have fun. I mean, you see some MMA fighters claiming that they love going in the octagon, that it's the most exciting thing, that's the most fun thing. And you're right, if they had to choose between being petrified and if, if you had to fight in an MMA fight at Mandalay Bay and there's 40,000 people in the audience and there's millions watching on TV and you could choose between one of two mindsets. I'm happy and excited to be here versus I'm absolutely petrified to be here. Which 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 of those mindsets is going to make you perform better? The excited Ob one, obviously. The yeah. the uh, excited to be here. So yeah, but back to the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm guessing that some of it is they just have a very 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 high threshold for excitement. But then, uh, okay, this is a tangent, but it's not that big a tangent. My mother was from Switzerland. My mother went to. Swiss high schools in the 50s and uh, early 60s. There were still teachers there who had dueling stars. So dueling stars came from, uh, there were various German, we'd almost call them uh, fraternities in the, I want to say late 1800s, early 1900s, certainly by the early 1900s. And we would be in a fraternity, a, a dueling society. And we would fence with live blades. And the it's fascinating because the rules were very, very strict. You couldn't lunge, right? Basically, you and I would be standing with our arms outstretched, with the blade just able to touch your face, essentially. I'm not allowed to step forward. I'm not allowed to step back. Neither are you. I'm not allowed to lunge. You're not allowed to lunge. So it's very different from the type of fencing that we're used to you know, seeing at the Olympics. No footwork. We're wearing a ton of protection around our necks so we don't die. We're wearing protection, I believe, on our wrists. And we've got this weird ass helmet that protects our eyes. Or, or you guys wear goggles with nose shields. Or there's also these weird helmets I saw that basically protect the eyes and the nose. What does that leave exposed? That leaves exposed the ear, the scalp, and the cheek. And the point was, all, was to compete here and to try and cut the other guy in the cheek. But if you got cut, this was a sign of honor, right? Because now you'd have this big 
prominent scar on your cheek that be sewed up. And for the rest of your life, people would know that you were a man, that you were a member of these dueling societies. And some of her teachers had these facial scars, or some of the older teachers. And, and so there's a, it's a very strong social component there as well. I'm sure, again, being German, they were pretty drunk at the time <laughs> doing this, <laughs> or well lubricated in any case. Uh, but there's a very strong social payoff. I, if if um, Conor McGregor walks into a nightclub, do you think he'll have any problems meeting women? I would argue zero, yeah. right? There's a, yes, he's an amazing fighter. Yes, he gets payoff from fighting. Yes, he gets money. But there's also a social status. Do you think he'd have any difficulty making friends? Forget women. I know it's a family show. Uh, he wants to chat to some guy. Do you think that guy would likely to chat if Conor McGregor came up to just about any random dude on the screen goes, hey, I'm Conor McGregor. Even the guy claimed to hate Conor McGregor the day before, and I'm not a big fan. I'm, I'm impressed by his fighting abilities, but I'm not a big fan of the man. But if he came up to me on the street and introduced himself, just that social, if I'm truly honest with myself, I probably wouldn't lead with, hey man, I really don't like your behavior in public. That's probably not what I would lead with. There, there's a certain amount of social mystique that gets accumulated by doing these things. So, back to the Germans, uh, you'd be forever known as the badass who fought with sharp axes in the backwoods of, uh, I don't know where it was, Heidelberg. <laughs> <laughs> right. Similarly, the facial scar from, you know, you'd, you'd be forever known as the badass who used to duel in, in college. So there, there's a strong social component and social status component to the fresh testing. Uh, one of my friends, the world, um, the world champion in face jumping, that's a pretty good opener to, at a party, right? Like, hey, did you know that Jamie a, was a world champion base jumper? Right? That's going to start a lot of conversation. So I, I think we can't really separate martial, high-level martial arts performance from the social status. Hmm. And it helps explain why some people stay with abusive instructors. It helps explain why some people stay with delusional instructors. It helps explain those videos that, uh, uh, that we've all seen and, and love to watch of the guy forming chi balls and then knocking his students over from 25 feet away or taking that chi ball and bouncing it off another wall and then hitting his student with a ricochet and the student just goes flying or the little old Aikido master pushing 12 people in a row. What's really causing those people to fall over? I would argue it's a, it's a strong element of social pressure. Mm. It's going to be pretty hard to resist if all of your friends are in the dojo and that's your entire social network and this is what you've spent years working towards. You really, really, really want to get your, your 12th degree black belt in yellow bamboo or, or, or whatever it is. That when the master comes running at you and, and makes the special hand signal, there's a ton, and everyone's watching. Everyone that you know is watching. And you've spent $10,000 getting that, that belt. You know what's expected of you in that moment. And that's that you fall over and flop around like a, a fish on dry land. So the, the, the social aspects of, of martial arts are, are incredibly important. And it can be positive, it can be negative. Right? I, I, I'm pretty confident in my self-defense abilities right now. Uh, I mean, I am getting older, but, you know, against the average person, I think I would do all right in most circumstances. It's, it's a statistical thing. 90% of the time, I think I would do all right. So, and there, there are simpler ways to work on health, fitness. Right? I could lift weights and I could do cardio, and I do do those things. But ultimately, one of the things that keeps bringing me back to martial arts, keeps me doing podcasts like this, it keeps me hanging out and going to seminars and teaching and training especially, is it's just, there's a, there's a super strong social component to it. It takes us back to our first conversation when you're looking for a club and you're going around from club to club to club to see where you want to train at, it's really important that you think that there's potential connection with the people there, that you like those people. If you're a tattooed steroid-using meathead, it's probably
probably want to find another club that has a whole bunch of people with facial tattoos and pit bulls. And, you know, you can all talk about your steroid regimen together. And that's great. You found your home. If you're uh, an ophthalmologist, you just want to train a little bit and not have your fingers broken, then you probably want to go to a different club. Because you'll, well, first of all, you're not going to get hurt. And second of all, uh, you'll have more in common with those people. So there's, a, there's I think the, the social aspect of martial arts, both positive and negative, isn't, often, isn't talked about often enough. I, I agree. And I, I want to unpack that last thing you brought up a little bit, because I, I, I'm seeing one side of me agreeing and, and another side disagreeing. Absolutely. We need to be places where we feel we belong, where we share things in common with the people that we're training with. But I can also see some value in training with people who have a different background, who look at the world differently. Okay, yes, I, I, I'm not going to disagree with you there. And I think some of that is inevitable. I think the extreme, so I think what you're talking about is the whole siloing, right? Where if I yeah. believe that climate change is a thing, I'm only ever going to talk to other people who believe that climate change is a thing. And if I believe that... Um, Archaeopteryx is a fake fossil. I'm only ever going to talk to other people who, have, who think that Archaeopteryx is a fake fossil. And thus, we're only going to be talking to our own kind, and we will just get deeper and deeper and deeper into our beliefs as opposed to occasionally interacting with other people who have different beliefs. And this is true sort of at a belief level, and it's true at a martial arts level as well. Is that, I'm, I'm putting words Absolutely. No, nope. no, you're right. You're right. Okay. So, yes, I 100% agree. Um, I mean, it. A very micro level of that is if you've just been training strict old school Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for 10 years, and then you go and train with somebody coming out of one of the shoot wrestling systems or, you know, trained with Eric Paulson, they will leg lock you silly. And you'll go, oh, I totally forgot about, you know, <laughs> protecting my legs when I'm in guard. Similarly, if, if you're just a just do judo. You're really good at judo. You're going to have a very specific style of newaza, of, of groundwork, which is works great in a judo context where you just need to survive and, and essentially turtle for three, five, ten seconds and get stood back up. But it's not a viable strategy in a real fight. It's also not a viable strategy in a jiu-jitsu match. But yeah, I, I'm, that, those are kind of micro examples of training with other people. And, and I agree. I'm talking more about style of training, right? Like, uh, so many people go, various clubs have various feelings, right? There, there, there are hardcore competition clubs where, there's, where it's okay to go out there and bang and just punch other guys in the head as hard as you can. Now you get your ophthalmologist wandering in there and uh, Mr. Biker want to be an MMA fighter goes, oh, fresh meat. That's a that's just a setup for a disaster. Mm. So I'm I'm pro meeting other people. I'm pro uh, style, martial arts stylistically. Running into people you never get you you wouldn't have met otherwise. I'm pro, uh, but I I think in terms of running into other. Well, in my in my best defense is my the story about how I the firefighting came on my radar right. Yeah. I didn't go to a club that was just full of professional biologists doing consulting work. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this club is, there, there are firefighters here, there are cops here, and there are criminals here. That would be a very interesting martial arts group. Yeah, it, uh, um, I mean, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. There were, there, there were other people who were self-unemployed or whatever, but that really did seem to be the three major cliques. Um, and by interacting training partners by trying to rip each other's heads off. Uh, my first training session ever, I got paired up with this firefighter who's built like a dump truck, just muscle on muscle. He triangle choked me and I leg locked him. And uh, we trained together continuously for the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, yeah, 15 years. So still one of my best friends. And, and so that, um, that opened up the doors for me, not only in a jiu-jitsu context, but also in a, in a 
life context, right? I managed to find a, a job that I didn't hate doing. Yeah. But it sounds like what you're talking about is, it's not so much the the backgrounds of the people, but the why or the rules of engagement, you know, just making sure you're all there for the same reasons. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm mainly talking about safety. I mean, the, like I said, right. the, I, if we're doing theoretical, I, I'm going to draw a somewhat imaginary line between theoretical martial arts and applied martial arts. I, I realize there's crossover and I realize that people who spend 90% of their time doing theoretical martial arts who can do 10% of applied and that people who spend almost all their time doing applied can go explore some other stuff once in a while too. I, I get it. It's not absolutely a hard dichotomy, but let's, let's divide the world. As, um, sure. I'm talking into applied versus theoretical martial arts. If it's a theoretical martial art and we're all doing, uh, I'll pick something that I've done. Hung our Kung Fu. We've all, uh, and, we never ever spar it, and we never ever pressure test it. And we're just there to learn the forms and the breathing techniques and the stances and, and the drills. The odds of getting hurt are pretty low. Yeah, you could, you know, man, I stayed too long in the horse stance. My AD doctors all flared up, or, or whatever. Or you know, I'm snapping this punch out too hard, and uh, it's beginning to bug my AC joints. But again, the chances of severe damage, and I would say the most severe of the damages is brain damage, right? The, that's the huge disadvantage of the striking martial arts. In order to test it, you're essentially incurring brain damage. Uh, right? CTE is a real thing, and many small concuss concussions is a big deal, and much small subconcussive trauma is also a big deal. So, unfortunately, strikers have got uh, <laughs> strikers sacrifice their brains, grapplers sacrifice their bodies, and I am confident that they'll have better orthopedic techniques in the future. But I would rather sacrifice my body than my brain. Mm. Um, but if we're doing a theoretical martial art, the odds of a catastrophic injury are reasonably low. So it doesn't really matter that, let's say you're standing beside the other guy and you're in Hungar class and you're doing uh, tiger crane form, and the guy beside you is just an absolute fanatic. Um, in his off month, he takes more steroids than most bodybuilders take in their lifetime. He shaved his head. He owns four pit bulls. He drives a Mustang. Uh, it doesn't matter, right? What's he going to do? He might swing a punch wildly and it might hit your shoulder. But it's, it's, it's not a dangerous thing. Unless, you know, uh, he starts, um, uh, you, know, you guys get into a conflict. But, but in, in general, the training itself isn't that, more that much more dangerous because there's a misalignment in, in purpose. But it's when you start field testing stuff, you start pressure testing stuff, when you start actually hitting other people, when you start actually grappling with them, when you start actually throwing with them, when you actually start swinging sharp swords at them, trusting they're only going to swing with a slash and not going to stab you into the belly, that that trust becomes super important. Right? You can make an argument that a, a sparring session is a trust exercise. Forget all these corporate training trust exercises where you're like, close your eyes and fall back and we will catch you and yay, you know, we're all a big happy group now. <laughs> the ultimate trust exercise is, is uh, applied martial arts. You have a lot going on and you're, you know, I, I didn't realize you had a full-time job on top of all of this. So when, when I add that new information to everything that you're doing, you're a busy guy and I know what it's like to be a busy guy and, and, and do all this stuff that we're doing podcasts and whatnot. So I guess the question is why, why have you chosen to be so busy? Well, you only get one crack at life, right? I mean, hmm. We all go take a long dirt nap eventually. And so you might as well try and get it all in. I think for me anyway, a, a big part of life is to experience as much as I can. And so uh, what are the experiences that I like having? I mean, I actually, yes, I put out a ton of YouTube videos. Generally speaking, I enjoy that process. I, I, I enjoy the filming process. 
I put out a fair number of podcasts, not as many as you, but a fair number. And I really enjoy talking to those people and making connections that way. So I don't think I'm just wildly, you know, if, if you had a German accent and I was lying on a couch and you'd ask me that same question, you'd clearly be probing for like, what are you running from, Stefan, by trying to fill up your, I'm not saying that you did this, but <laughs> I don't think I, I'm I, running from anything. I think I'm running towards something and that's okay. to, to experience, have as many good experiences as possible mm. and to, to fill my cup. I, I, I really do enjoy most of what I do. I, I, with the firefighting, 99 days out of 100, I'm really looking forward to going to work. I enjoy it. There's a, a it, it meets physical needs, it meets intellectual needs, it meets social needs, right? The, uh, we have a good meal, so all, you know, all levels of Maslow's hierarchy are, are getting checked off. Sure. Uh, well, not all, but um, many of the levels of Maslow's hierarchy are getting uh, checked off. I have a good day at work. Again, martial arts fills many of those needs. I am also, you know, once in a while, not as often as I would like, I get away into the wilderness, and that's sort of the three big boxes of my life, right? The uh, uh, stuff in the wilderness. Uh, obviously, the fire department is a large amount of time. But you know what? There are 168 hours in a week. Even if you're working a 40-hour week, and then we count for a couple of hours to shower and to eat, it still leaves an all, and, and another, uh, um, say, 56 hours to sleep, because we're all getting eight hours of sleep every night, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not so much. But it still leaves an awful lot of hours. And I think most people leave an awful lot of hours on the table. Right? They, uh, well, you know, I watched Peaky Blinders, the first episode it wasn't really that good, but maybe the second episode will get better. And, you know, well, the first season wasn't that good, but I've watched everything else on Netflix. So now I'll watch season two. Uh, through that, like if, if, if there's going to be, if, if I'm going to watch something, well, it's pretty rare, but it, it better be worth it. And where I'm walking out, like I think one of the most liberating things in terms of time management is walking out of movies halfway and stopping watching uh, TV series halfway and yeah, just throwing out your TV in general. 168 hours a week, even somebody with a 40 hour uh, work week and sleeping say 56 hours a week. Let's add that up. That roughly equals a hundred. That still leaves 68 hours a week. To, to, it essentially leaves a second full-time job to to achieve what you want to achieve, to, to do what you want to do. Now, I recognize that people with kids, that this is much harder, right? I, I'm sure, because I've listened to people talk like this, and I've been yelling at the, uh, at the podcast player or the radio, and like, what about kids, you beep, 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 beep. <laughs> and I get it. I'm there. I've got a couple of teenagers. Like, I'm in the show for years. It really means that you got to do some creative scheduling and you really got to cut out the, the unessential stuff, right? I, I would dearly love to have a super well-organized uh, office where I do my video editing. You know, I, I'd love to have all my books in preferably alphabetical order. And when, you know, two books are, have the same title, I'd prefer to have them arranged by size or something. <laughs> I'd like to have all my recording equipment, video camera equipment, neatly shelved away. Let's just say it's not. Because you know, in the triage that is life, you know, you're, you're focusing on the most important thing first. For me, I, I would actually far rather train than spend two hours organizing my office. If you're a, a practitioner of Zen minimalism, maybe you'd enjoy uh, organizing your office more. It's still a lot of hours. There are a lot of hours in the week. It's a long way of saying that. Yeah. One one of the sayings that I'm prone to is your actions, your activities reflect your priorities because we all have the same number of hours. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that 
if I do something that someone else chooses not to do, they're wrong or I'm wrong. It just means that this is a priority to me and it's not to you or vice versa. And that's okay. It's okay to look at the world differently. I think it was the Getting Things Done book, which uh, divides tasks into four quadrants. It's the urgent and not urgent and the important and not important Mm. quadrant, right? So you can have things that are urgent but not important, and you can have things that are urgent and important. If you have an arterial neck bleed, that is both urgent (laughs) and important. You better do something about it right now. Uh, The fact that uh, but social media is built around things that are seem urgent but are actually unimportant. But right? if your phone is continuously popping up with notifications, you have a new email. Your TikTok video just got another like, um, yeah. or whatever. Right. These are things that are urgent. They're popping up on your phone, for God's sake. Right? There's a notification and everything. It even makes a sound. Urgent, not important. Then there are things that are uh, not urgent but important. Right, uh, you're slowly going into more and more debt. This is important, but it's not urgent. The bank, you know, the credit card company is going, "Hey, Stefan, you should really cut back on your spending." Uh, they're happy that you're spending. Right, this right. Is, uh, not urgent. You could probably go another uh, couple of years before you totally max out that card, and then we'll give you a you know, time to give you another raise. What do they call it when they extend your credit limit? Uh, yeah. Or I don't know, arterial arterial heart disease it's not urgent but it's important until all of a sudden it is urgent um, and then of course there's not important and not urgent things so I, I would argue that not having my books lined up uh, in perfect alphabetical and chronological and size order is, is neither urgent nor important mm-hmm. then ditch as many of the unimportant things as you can you're just left with what you were calling the priority absolutely if people want to find you i know you've got a ton of stuff going on let's let's hear it okay. for people that might be new to Ooh. your endeavors well uh a lot of the gateway drug for a lot of people is my youtube channel so if you go to youtube.com slash stefan kesting or just search my name on youtube you should find the roughly i don't know well over a thousand videos by now wow. That's awesome. uh, covering. I've got a couple of channels there. I've got the uh, the original Stephen Kesson channel, which is mostly jiu-jitsu, mostly grappling and judo. It's it's the the man hugging sport. I've got a second channel called Self Defense Tutorials, where I'm going a little bit more into the the striking, the the weapons and the myth busting, right? The uh, examples of the things that i think are completely ridiculous and sort of uh, uh, the mistakes that are easy to make if you're just starting out so that, that the youtube is a good one uh if people want to uh, get an introduction to brazilian jiu-jitsu i've got a whole bunch of resources for that the one that i would recommend is i've got a short book out there called a roadmap for brazilian jiu-jitsu a roadmap for bjj and that is uh, um, like a, a look at the the underlying positions of jiu-jitsu. When people look at jiu-jitsu initially, or or any kind of grappling for that matter, they don't see positions. They just see a wild jumble of arms and legs, and oh my god, what that what's that guy's head doing there? And I I, I see a hand grabbing something. Not really sure if that's a sleeve or a leg or a, or a lapel. And it's very confusing. But if you start looking and start breaking it down by position, then you can explain like 80 or 90% of what's happening in an average jiu-jitsu match. Or if, conversely, if you're in a match or if you're rolling around on the ground, there's a tremendous power in knowing, oh, I'm on the bottom of side control. I, know what I, I don't know what to do, but I know where I am. Or alternately, now that I know where I am, I know what to do. Whereas before, you're just being smushed on the bottom. And there is no answer to being smushed on the bottom. There are answers to side control. And uh, one other thing, this is a kind of an interesting one. It's going to be a little bit different from the, the standard pitch that you get. Um, I'm only here. I'm only alive. I'm only training. I'm only producing uh, instructionals. You know, because five years ago, I had a kidney transplant. So my brother, 
gave me his kidney. Mm. So what I started doing is I've got an open offer to anyone who has uh, signed their organ donor card. I know that's in the States or is an organ, you know, is eligible to be an organ donor. If they get in touch with uh, me or the person who's helping me through support at grapplearts.com and, and essentially send me a photo of your driver's license with a little organ donor box checked off and you can cover up your address. I don't need to know your address. I don't need to know your driver's license. If you send that there, we'll give you one of any one of my instructionals. Some of these instructionals, they sell for a couple hundred dollars. If you go to grapplearts.com slash online or grapplearts.com and look at the uh, instructional videos, I'll give you the online form mm. of any one of those for being an organ donor. So that's something that I've really started pushing in the last six months. Uh, I should, uh, sadly, I have to make the caveat that I'm give you one of them. There's people who've been contacting us every few months going, I'm still an organ donor. Can I get a new one? <laughs> <laughs> and it took us a little while to figure this out. But no, the answer about, is no. How about one per organ? Yeah. Well, if you're actually given an yeah, organ. That seems reasonable. No, then you get everything. Oh, okay. I'll happily give you, All if right. you've actually given a kidney or given a, a lobe of your liver or, uh, you know, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll give you everything. But if you just signed up in the event of your death, that uh, they can harvest you. And okay, that sounds that sounds pretty cool, cruel. But I'll put it in context. I'll I'll end on a high, cheery note. Uh, when I was 23, my 21 year old brother died in a motorcycle accident, and it was horrific. I wasn't there. My parents were right there, and it was not fast. It was painful. And so they were incredibly traumatized, but they gave, you know, they, they allowed him to become an organ donor posthumously. And he, his body, they, he and my parents' decision saved a couple of lives. My parents got to meet those people. Uh, one kid got his heart, and I think his lungs went to somebody else. For sure, the heart, they, they stayed in touch with the kid who had received my brother's heart. And this, I mean, obviously, they're devastated. Obviously, this is a hole that they can never be filled. But knowing that it saved somebody else's life really helped them deal with the trauma. It, 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 was a, it took them from, I don't know, a 10 out of 10 on the grief scale to a few years later, you know, a 7 out of 10, a 6 out of 10, because there was at least some purpose. So I, I saw it help people directly. It helped me too. I, I, I never ended up meeting that kid. I, I was not in the same city. I would have been happy to. But yeah, it provided some small level of solace to me, knowing that it wasn't all in vain. So if you die, if, if you sign your organ donor card and then you die in a, a dump truck accident tomorrow, you're dead. That doesn't change. You know, you, but who's left? Your family's left. And your family will probably be helped knowing that, uh, that some of you lives on and that it, it helped some other family not lose somebody. So that's, that's why I'm so passionate about the whole organ donor program. Um, it hasn't come and bit me in the ass yet. Um, and so I'm going to keep on doing it. So yeah, there's a, so many people unconsciously opt out or they, they never opt in. And it's so easy to do. You check a box and you talk to your family. You go, look, I feel pretty strongly about when I die, should I die, that I get, that my death serves some kind of purpose. Um, so yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with that program. And I should have probably slipped it in earlier before uh, at, at the beginning of the podcast somehow. Next time. Next time. Yeah, I think I you're the very first podcast on which I've pitched this. Oh. So. Well, thank you. And this is normally the point where I would I would ask the guests to to kind of send us out, but I I think that what you've just said is far more powerful than than anything we can tack on. So I think we should just leave it there. All right, hard cut. Thank you so much. I had a great time talking with Stefan, and I hope you had a good time listening. Certainly got the wheels turning, and I've got some stuff to think about. So thank you for coming on the show, sir. Really appreciated your time and your openness. If you want more, head over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com 
There you can find videos and social media and links and pictures and more, not just for this episode, but for everyone we've ever made. If you're willing to support us in the work we do, you have a number of options, like making a purchase at whistlekick.com with the code PODCAST15 to save 15%, or leaving a review, buying a book, helping us with our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And of course, we want your guest suggestions. If you have an idea for a great guest for Martial Arts Radio, I want to hear it. You can let us know via social media, or you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.